All right, folks, thanks for uh, coming by and uh, joining the session. Uh, so today we're going to do things slightly different here. Instead of uh, focusing on an overview of this week's video lecture, we're actually going to go through a different set of slides for a uh, lecture that's coming up next week, uh, and that is the uh, analytical writing lecture. Okay, so. Let's take a look at what we have in store for us. What we're going to be doing is talking over the basics of analytical writing. Uh, the main reason I'm doing it this way is because, uh, in my opinion, it's they have us go through certain things uh, for the class before we even get to this point. But unfortunately, they don't give me a lot of time to have this assignment done. So if you're trying to do the assignment without knowing how to do analytical writing, well, that's really not going to do you much good. Okay? So, <clears throat> let's talk about analytical writing. Okay? Uh, analysis comes from a writer's need to understand. Now, by writing an analytical essay, you are attempting to share your journey of discovery with an audience, and a well-written analytical essay will communicate clearly to the reader the exact information they need to understand along with the author. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, I don't have the textbook with me, but there are uh, examples at the start of Chapter 5 in the textbook. Okay? Uh, I've got a brief overview of those examples here. Uh, one of them is a group of students in an environmental policy class analyzed costs for transporting food to encourage their campus to buy locally and go green. Okay? Uh, this calls for an analytical essay as part of the argument that the campus should uh, start uh, locally sourcing their food. Okay. Uh, next one, Jim investigated the costs of four-year college versus two-year college, including advantages and disadvantages of both, and wrote an essay about his findings. Okay. <clears throat> uh, in this case, he's doing it for a uh, class assignment uh, as a senior in high school. Uh, but he's doing the an analysis of how much the cost difference is and how much the cost savings is by starting off at the two-year college as opposed to starting off at the four-year, okay? Uh, third one, Amber pondered whether the U.S. efforts to rebuild Afghanistan were causing more harm than good and wrote a blog posting discussing what she learned on the ground while serving there in the Army, Okay. This is an actual example of somebody using their personal experience as part of the analysis, uh, which is always a good thing. Okay, You don't want to discount personal experience uh, as opposed to academic evidence because personal experience can sometimes be a lot more valuable in this respect. Okay, So uh, all three of these situations involve the need to understand an important issue and the desire to communicate what's been learned. Uh, that is the whole key to analysis, and that's why I choose the analysis essay to be the one that you're writing based on a scholarship program because they, the scholarship provider is going to want to know what you've learned and how you apply that uh, in terms of where you, how far in the future you're going to go. I'm going to adjust my camera a little bit here. All right. So let's talk about understanding analytical writing. Okay, uh, it's the most common form of college writing. It's typically. A research paper is an analytical essay. You're examining an issue or problem, finding appropriate sources, and analyzing the issue in an appropriate manner for the course. Okay? Now, effective analytical writing involves three elements. Uh, desire, the desire to understand. Okay? You want to know what's going on with that topic. Uh, it needs a careful examination of the evidence. Uh, looking over what you found, the facts that back you up, the facts that back up uh, other speakers, uh, and then well-reasoned conclusions. Okay, they want a lot of uh, input in terms of what kind of conclusions can you reach based on what you found in terms of breaking down this this topic and analyzing individual pieces. Now, Yagelsky presents the steps of analytical writing through the story of writing a hypothetical psychology essay. Okay. Uh, now, there is some reading here. We're not going to go over it. Again, this is just a quick overview. Uh, we're going to go into more details with these slides uh, when I actually go through them next week. Okay. Uh, so, I want to, first off, I want what I'll have you guys do is read the essay excerpt on page 130. 
Uh, this is an essay titled The Perils of Being Perfect. Uh, and this is an example of the desire to understand. Okay. Uh, basically, what you're talking about here is you want to know why something works the way it does, and that's why you're analyzing it. Okay. So uh, there's a couple of there's a few ways that you do informal analysis on your own uh, without having to deal with academics. Okay. Uh, you do informal analysis by talking with friends. Okay. Uh, what do they think about the subject matter? What do they think about what you're talking about? Uh, what do they think about the issue? Uh, reading the news. Uh, this is usually a good source for finding out stuff about your topic, especially if it's something that is in the news and you're finding that there's conflicting elements about it. Uh, you can also do some light online research. Look around uh, through uh, Google. See what you can find about the topic. Now, in academic writing, analysis is shaped by the academic subject being studied. Okay, So you're going to be putting your analysis through the window of whatever subject it is that that analysis is being written for. Typically, it's whatever the class is. So if it's for, uh, as Yigelsky is using an example of a psych, a psych essay, Okay, uh, if it's for a psychology class, you're going to be looking at it through the lens of what am I learning in the psychology class. Uh, if it's a if it's an essay for like a science class, then you're going to be looking at it through the lens of what am I learning in the science class, so on and so forth. Okay. Uh, next part, careful examination of the evidence. Again, there's another uh, article example here. It's an article titled Opportunity in Higher Education by Michael S. McPherson and Morton Owen Shapiro. Uh, this is studying enrollment rates based on income versus math test scores. Okay. So uh, what these reporters are actually doing is looking at uh, the correlation between income and those math test scores and how they affect college admissions. And what they're actually finding is that the higher math test scores among the poorer students uh, were more likely to get in than lower math scores with poorer students. With wealthier students, uh, they didn't really care what scores they got because they had the money to pay for it. Okay. So when the evidence creates questions and the desire to understand, that evidence can usually be analyzed through careful examination to find your answer. Okay? You want to try to uh, break things down into elements that are easier for you to handle in terms of thinking about them, in terms of writing about them, in terms of explaining them. Okay? That's half of the battle of analysis. Okay. This is kind of, this is something you need to take note of because this is what you're doing with this analysis essay. Okay. Uh, next is well-reasoned conclusions. Okay. Uh, on page 132, uh, the essay about education researchers looking at government education policies. Okay. Uh, so there is a, a excerpt from a book titled "Democracy at Risk: The Need for a New Federal Policy in Education." Okay. Uh, and these are, this is written by a group, again, of education researchers. They're looking at education policies enacted by the U.S. government. Okay. So occasionally your trigger for analysis is a thoroughly researched conclusion that another researcher reached. So you, what you may want to do is understand how they came to that conclusion. So that's kind of what these guys are doing is that they're looking at the conclusion that was reached and trying to work backward from there and break it down and find out, okay, how did they reach this conclusion? What facts did they use? What kind of reasoning did they have? Uh, how did they reach this particular uh, end product? Okay. Uh, ap academic writers rarely give simple solutions to analyses. Typically, their conclusions supported by the available data and occasionally raise new questions. Okay. So we're not looking for something that's going to be 100% reliable. We're not looking for something that is indisputable. Uh, we're actually looking for something that can be debated, that is going to open up the conversation. Please forgive the cat that just jumped on my chair. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Uh, next part: performing analysis. Okay. Analysis essays typically involve free intellectual tasks that come together to create the process. So one of the things is using a framework to analyze the subject. Okay, uh, you're going to go through uh, the subject uh, by applying it to a framework for the analysis. How you're going to break it down, what individual parts you're going to break it down into. Okay, 
Make reasonable claims based on the basis of available information. <laughs> okay? So your claims have to be uh, backed up by evidence. Whatever you find over the course of any research that you do or any reasoning that you make, okay? These are all things that have to be uh, considered when you're making claims. They have to make sense. They have to come from a place of logic. And then finally, supporting claims. Okay, finding the evidence that backs up those claims. These are typically all composed in the idea generation stage of the writing process and refined as you continue through drafting and revision. Okay, so at the point that you're at right now with this essay, this is what you should be looking for. Okay, uh, the facts that are going to back up your assertion based on whatever essay it is that you're writing for the scholarship. Okay, again, this part, this essay should be an analysis essay at heart. Okay. <clears throat> then using a framework to analyze. Analysis requires some sort of framework to explain or understand a problem, trend, event, or idea. Okay. Uh, and there's a lot of possibilities for what this framework could be. Okay. Three possibilities that Jodelsky specifically gives. It can be a theory. Uh, is it something that people are using to uh, place a lens upon an issue or upon a certain set of circumstances? Uh, it could be a principle. Uh, is it some kind of legal principle that uh, is being used as a governing point by uh, certain people involved with the process? Uh, or it could be a set of criteria. Okay? Is it something where you have a certain amount of uh, requirements that you have to meet? Okay? Using a framework focuses attention on the specifics of the topic. It allows you to break it down, break down the topic in a way that makes logical sense. Okay, uh, it allows you to focus in on what specifically is making this issue the way it is. Okay, uh, I see an issue. Uh, notice about connection issues. That's fine. Uh, just try to keep up as you can. Again, uh, as usual, this is going to be posted as a video to YouTube. So if you miss anything, you can catch up. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, apply frameworks appropriately. Use all the elements of the framework and apply them to the topic. Okay, every element of that framework. So every every viewpoint from that theory, or every application of that principle, or every single piece of criteria that you have in your set of criteria. Okay, use all the elements and apply them to the topic. Okay, theories should be used as a lens to help the reader understand the topic analysis. Okay. So it's going to be a way of allowing your reader to understand this is the perspective that you're giving to the uh, essay and to your look at the essay. Okay. Uh, elements that create different perspectives on the subject also help with this. Okay. If you find some things that allow for differing perspectives on the subject, uh, maybe some firsthand accounts that don't necessarily jive with uh, some of the academic writing on the topic, that can help uh, with applying your framework. All right, making reasonable claims with available information. So claims that you make based on your research need to have a logical basis in the actual research. So you can't make wide assertions without proof of these assertions. Uh, there has to be some fact that backs up any claim that you make. Okay. So on page 136, there's an excerpt there that gives you uh, a student using uh, a couple of different logical fallacies. Uh, one is a, uh, a false comparison or an apples to oranges comparison of the of two studies. Uh, and then uh, the other one is a black or white fallacy. Uh, that's also called an either or fallacy, where they're trying to force you to choose one side or another, when there's really more, more nuance to it. OK? So. Uh, you should only make claims with a strong basis in evidence for which you have clear proof. Uh, your claims need to be based in the research that you've done and the information that you're finding. Okay, Page 137, again, there's an excerpt for this. Uh, this book uses enormous research projects to support their assertion that lacking fiber in your diet does not cause an increase in health risk. Now I'm kind of remembering without the textbook what these were about. Okay. Uh, so these were both about uh, dietary concerns. In fact, I think that first one 
was uh, dealing with uh, veganism and how uh, I think they were trying to make the claim that a, ve a vegan diet is overall healthier uh, for people, but uh, they're missing the point, okay? Some of the finer points of veganism, okay? And how vegetarianism can sometimes is not exactly the perfect answer. Okay. Uh, next we get to supporting claims. When you make a claim in an essay, it will need to be supported by evidence to prove in a reasonable, logical manner that that claim is correct. Okay? You need to have some sort of basis in fact for all of your claims. Consider whether the support for you offer for your claims is appropriate and adequate. That's quality versus quantity. Okay? Now, appropriate claims are acceptable and relevant to the discipline. They rest on dependable, respectful sources, and they're consistent with your audience's expectations. Okay? So, if you have an appropriate claim that is uh, going to uh, prove your point, you need to put it in there. Okay? Uh, you have to also make sure that they're adequate. They're sufficient in terms of type and amount of support. Okay? Uh, the type of and amount of support in turn is persuasive to the intended audience. Okay? So here's another element where you have to consider rhetorical situation as well. Uh, you have to consider whether the audience is going to be predisposed to agree or disagree with your source, depending on who it is, okay? Especially if it's like a recognized expert, okay? We're seeing this a lot in the news lately when we have several health experts that are, uh, let's be quite frank, being ignored over uh, COVID-19, okay? In favor of some other questionable uh, experts, okay? Uh, place experts clearly in quotation marks, okay? <clears throat> so, uh, there is an example of this, uh, analyzing this on page 141. Uh, it gives a flow chart for how to determine uh, ad appropriate and adequate claims on page 142, okay? Uh, in the case of this particular example, it is a po political science uh, statement a political, uh, an excerpt from a political science essay. Part of what they're using as the evidence is a uh, quote from a very significant political science philosopher uh, who is well known in the field. Okay, so that alone makes that claim adequate, and because the claim is related to uh, the, because the evidence is related to the claim being made in the essay, uh, that makes it appropriate as well. Okay. <clears throat> All right. Then we have a uh, slide about evidence activity. Okay. Uh, page. There's an excerpt on page 142 to 143 about reasons for a community's economic struggles. Okay. Uh, this is going to be wind up being a, uh, a questions to professor exercise when we get to it in the lectures. Okay. Uh, two primary claims are made in the expert in the excerpt, and you have to ter determine whether. The evidence presented for those claims is appropriate, that is to say, relevant to the claims being made, and then whether the evidence presented in the expert is adequate for the claims. Okay. Uh, here's the here's the hard part. Here. Bugelski yeah. gives you an mm -hmm. assessment. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, but I want you to write your own assessment of the the evidence presented to see if they line up with the claims. Okay. We're not going to worry about this one yet. We're going to worry about this when we get to this lecture. I actually misspoke earlier. This lecture isn't coming for another two weeks. Okay. Uh, but I wanted to give you guys a heads up on this now because you're in this stage of writing this analysis essay. So you want to be able to understand what you're supposed to be doing. Okay. Otherwise, you'll be getting this way too late. Okay. Pass Zygielski's verdict. Here we go. So here we get to the actual features of analytical writing. This is what you want to keep in mind, okay? Uh, the, so for the features of analytical writing, first off, it should have a relevant topic worthy of analysis, okay? So for the purposes of this essay, for most of you, that topic is being given to you, uh, but you have to make sure that it's something that you can analyze. So how do we determine that? The topic is a good fit for the academic field of study. It addresses a relevant question in the field as interesting to the writer and relevant to the readers. Okay, so if you're working with schol with scholarship providers, uh, they're going to give you a topic that is a fit for their field of study. 
Okay, it should be something that's relevant already. Now, in your interest and your audience interest is going to be wholly up to you. Okay. <clears throat> Let me get complexity. The exploration of the topic goes into as much detail as possible to best understand the subject. There should be a measure of objectivity and skepticism to make sure explanations are not oversimplified. Okay. So when you're talking complexity, we're saying we're not going to take everything at face value. We're going to give, give a skeptics approach. Uh, we're going to question claims and look for proof of them before we uh, proclaim that, yes, this claim is correct. Okay. Uh, it needs to have sufficient and appropriate evidence and support. So sufficient evidence depends on the topic, rhetorical situation, and depth of analysis. Okay. So however much evidence you need to present is going to be based in those particular aspects here. What your topic is, how much information is available there, uh, your rhetorical situation, who you're talking to, uh, circumstances hey, you're surrounded in. Uh, and then the depth of the analysis, how far down the rabbit hole are you going to dive? Okay. Appropriate evidence depends on the subject, the expectations of the audience, the purpose of the analysis, and the field of study. Okay. Uh, so what it is that you're writing about, uh, what your audience is expecting you to talk about, uh, the reason why you're performing the analysis, the reason why you have chosen that topic to perform the analysis of, and then eventually the field of study that the analysis falls into. And then at the end, you have reasonable conclusions. Okay, Your conclusions, that is, say, your claim for your thesis and all of the claims, must be interpreted from the evidence in the most logical manner possible. Your thesis should never be treated as indisputable fact. All thesis statements leave openings for discussion and debate. This is why I say that a thesis statement should not be just a plain statement of fact. It needs to be something that can be debated. Okay, uh, So your conclusion has to be derived through argument, through presenting reasoning, but through presenting logical evidence that backs those reasons, which in turn backs your uh, conclusion, that backs your claim. Okay. All right, so that's the basics for an analysis. It's not, we're not getting into this, this is a paper. We already talked about the mechanical <clears throat> specifics for this paper, but this is basically to give you an idea of what kind of I'm looking for. Okay, uh, right. that's the approach. It's the approach <laughs> that you should take when you're looking at the subject matter that your scholarship providers are giving you. Okay, uh, whatever subject matter your, scho your scholarship provider wants you to write on, this is how I want you to write about it. Okay. All right, so with that uh, over and done with, um, this would be the time uh, that uh, we can go ahead and take some questions. I did see a thing about someone isn't muted. Unfortunately, we've got two people calling in, and the callers do not have a mute option. Okay? So uh, if we're getting some background noise, it's, pro it's probably from them. Uh, we're just going to have to we'll, – we'll handle it. Okay? So with that in mind uh, – Let's go ahead and start taking some questions for this week. Uh, if you have any concerns that you want to bring up, uh, go ahead, raise your hand. I recognize you, and uh, we can uh, talk them over. Nancy, I see your hand there. What's your question? Is there a certain day that the draft is due? Okay, so uh, the drafts for this particular essay, the uh, revision draft, uh, is going to be workshop the week of September 28th, which is two weeks from now. Uh, and then three weeks from now will be the second draft, uh, which is the proofreading and editing draft. That week also the final draft is due. So once you've proofread, and, once you've proofread it, uh, then you can just go ahead and turn it right in. Okay? So by September 28th, we have to have had the draft turned in to you or to the team? It's posted to the team discussion board for workshopping. Uh, the team's going to be giving you feedback. Okay. Okay. All right, Dan, I see your hand there. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, how do we know? Like when we are writing our essay, how do we know if it's like our like how do we like 
know that we it's the analysis essay of that you want us to do because it's like I already written my essay and I'm like and I'm reading it and making sure it's okay but now it's like I'm trying I feel like I'm second guessing myself and it's like I don't know if it's correct or not okay well that's part of the and why we want you to, want you to do workshopping because that's one of the things your team's going to help you with because uh, it helps to get a second set of eyes on it to see if uh, it matches up whatever it is the goal was of the paper. Okay. okay. If you can get somebody else in the household to take a look at it as well and let them know what the basics of the assignment are that it's supposed to be analysis, they can probably help you out in terms of see. Uh, how much of the analysis you've made and what you can do to change Okay, thank you. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and put up uh, this week's uh, slides, okay, uh, so that we can talk about any uh, questions they, they may have this week's. Okay, first off, one other thing I want to mention about this week's first off, um, I first off I want to apologize for the abrupt opening for this uh, particular uh, for this particular week's uh, uh, video. Uh, as it turned out, uh, I was the victim of a copyright troll who tried to uh, do a copyright claim on my uh, music. That I use, which incidentally, if you're interested, is it, it was music that I got from a, uh, a free licensing uh, website that uh, only requires uh, acknowledgement of the composer. Uh, otherwise, it's a free license uh, covered under Creative Commons. Uh, we actually get into a lot of this when we talk about uh, when we start talking about the blogs here in about a month or so. Uh, but just to let you know, I had. Uh, actually had two copyright trolls hit me because somebody hit me on another video for the end music okay uh, so I disputed both of them uh, one of them didn't uh, one of them decided they were gonna just ignore my dispute and keep the uh, keep the uh, copyright hit uh, the other one uh, settled the copyright hit but then I found out that what YouTube wound up doing was uh, slicing the opening off of my uh, video because this place decided that, oh, we we own this free music that you used, uh, even though they probably got it from the same source. So that was mildly annoying, I have to say. Uh, yeah, Dan, I see you there. Go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, I had another question. Um, we, don't, we can use our teams, like, whenever we want we it doesn't have to be like exactly the dates that you told us like it doesn't have to be exactly of the week of the 28th and everything uh, we can just like use it use it if we want to if yes like yes, we you need can, some help yeah you can you can use the discussion boards whenever you need it uh okay. it's just that i have certain uh dates that i have set for those workshops and that's why i set particular dates for the workshopping sessions oh, okay thank you all right all right so uh if there's any questions about some of the uh stuff that we talked about in this week's lecture uh because we were talking about the 10 core concepts in action uh i'm trying to see 
Yeah, there it is. Okay. Uh, one of the elements that I have, and that's that involves the uh, question professor board, uh, was this slide, which involves the uh, uh, 1960 presidential debate. Uh, and I've had a couple of responses to it thus far. In fact, I'm going to check and see if we've got some more right now. Uh, I've gotten some discuss some uh, res exactly two responses to it thus far that I'd seen. Uh, one where somebody had watched the audio, and one where per somebody had just watched the uh, video. Yeah, that's all I've got to is right now. So, uh, if there's any confusion about what I want you to do here, uh, basically, uh, we're gonna you're gonna be comparing uh, the two perspectives here, uh, but you're gonna be doing it based on what your classmates' react reaction is. Uh, so what we're what I want you to do when you get to this particular part of the lecture, and I mentioned this in the lecture, I want you to flip a coin to determine how you're going to uh, uh, be exposed to this particular piece of media. Uh, and when you flip the coin, if it comes up heads, you can watch the video. So you're going to you're going to represent the television audience in 1960. If it comes up tails, you can't watch the video. You can only listen to the audio to it. Okay, that may, that way you're going to represent the radio audience. Okay, and based on which style, which way you are exposed to it, you have to decide which candidate did better. Okay, uh, if the individual snippet I give you didn't help. Uh, the uh, JFK Presidential Library has the full video of this very debate uh, posted to YouTube. Okay, uh, their channel is simply called JFK Library, uh, and you can find this 1960 debate on YouTube. It runs about uh, close to two hours long, um, <clears throat> and you'd be able to uh, you'd be able to do the entire debate, either just an audio version or watching it. Okay, I only give you the snippet here because I can't I can't exactly post a three-hour lecture. Okay, so uh, so uh, can I get? Does anybody have any questions about this week's slides about ten core concepts in action, uh, or about any of the exercises I give you? Because mostly it's journal exercises. I have another cat invading, I apologize. All right, so any uh, general uh, questions that anybody has about the uh, about the topic, uh, about uh, the assignment, about anything on eCampus, uh, if there's any further MindTap questions, uh, go ahead and uh, shoot them out there now. Uh, 
Right then, right I see you there. Go ahead. Okay, I didn't rem I didn't think of the mind tap until now. So, I already done the first part of the of the unit one of the unit one for mind tap, and then when I'm looking on the second part, I now that starts getting confused because I don't know what's going on for mind tap and like it's the unit two thing for a mind tap and I don't know like. I got confused on that part. And... Okay. Uh, well, as I as I said at the start of the, the semester here, uh, my cap is going to be self-paced for you guys. So uh, you guys are going to be able to do it and speed that you're comfortable with. So if you're at uh, unit two already, you don't have to start that. That's actually going to be the section when we start getting into the blog. So, okay. so we're about a month. Okay. It's just that I got so confused so, with it, and I'm like, sorry. I looked through the little sections, and I'm like, what? I, I didn't understand. Yeah, all that will get explained, explained in the, the uh, lecture. Lectures will make sure to that point. Okay. Thank you. No problem, no problem. Fernando. I see you there. Go ahead. To clarify everything on mindset is self paced. I'm sorry, what's that? Tab self paced. Ah, uh, you know what? Okay, uh, you're you're cutting out on me. I'm not getting the whole question here. Let's see. Oh, everything's self-paced. Okay, uh, not everything is self-paced. Uh, the mind tap stuff is, uh, but uh, the others, anything else outside of mind tap, I'm going to have a set schedule for, and I will give you the dates for those. Okay, like for instance, this first essay, uh, we have a uh, first workshop session on uh, week of the 28th September. Uh, then the second workshop session is going to be the week of the 5th of October. Okay, so. Uh, you guys will have a schedule for everything that's not mind tap related. Okay. All right, Nancy, I see okay. your hand there. Go ahead with your question. Uh, I was gonna ask. Oh, is there a website where um a certain website where there's a lot of scholarship essay promptings? Because I'm not really sure what it's like. Or do I just look it okay. up? Okay. Okay. Uh. What I would recommend, I'm checking it right now. Uh, I've got uh, a search on Google for scholarship programs. Uh, if you just do that, uh, it'll actually give you a uh, full slate of sites where you have uh, aggregated links to, to uh, scholarships. Okay. Uh, some of these are uh, specific to particular places. Uh, it may be specific to your geography as well. Uh, I might note that uh, on my search, uh, because I'm in Longview, it gives me some Longview specific stuff. Well, for instance, one of the uh, one of the links that came up for me was Church Match Grant Program from Laterno University, uh, which is in town here. Uh, also, another one for a city scholarship for a technical training scholarship grant. Okay. Uh, in fact, let me go ahead and share my screen and show you what I'm looking at here. Uh, give me a second here. All right, I'm going to share my screen so that you can see what I'm looking at. All right, so this is what comes up for me at least when I Google scholarship programs. I'm going to try to click one of these links. Uh, I probably want to do this one, scholarship, collegescholarships.org, uh, which is going state by state. Okay. Uh, then we have divisions on browsing the scholarships over here. We have athletic scholarships, minority scholarships, degree level scholarships. Then we have ones by subject, which is probably what we want to work with all of these. Okay. So if I go with by subject, okay. Then we have a whole list of different subjects, which are pretty much uh, they correspond to mostly college majors. Okay, so 
for mine, if, if I were doing this assignment for my own particular major, I would go into Arts and Humanities. Uh, then they have some specific stuff within that. Uh, let's see. I'd go, let's try miscellaneous writing. That's what I would do if it was me. Okay. Um, and this gives you some scholarships that they have. Uh, so, uh, in that particular uh, academic study field. Okay. Uh, this one is a uh, scholarship for scholastic art and writing, uh, poets and writers. Uh, Davidson College has a writing scholarship. Okay. Uh, then you have one for Naropa University, which is uh, in Boulder, Colorado. It is actually a Buddhist university. Okay. Uh, and oh, here's the fun part. Fun fact, it's home to the Jack Kerouac School for Disembodied Poetics. That's a heck of a school name there. Uh, Kate Herzog Scholarship uh, for uh, it's sponsored by William Ed Writers in Barnes and Noble. Okay. Uh, unfortunately, it's only for writers in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, scholarships from writers leagues, so on and so forth. Okay. Now this is just specific to writing. Uh, if you're looking for like a, a more traditional college uh, major, uh, let's say for instance you want to go into uh, let's say nursing. Okay. Uh, we have degree levels here, undergraduate, graduate. We have nursing specialties. Okay. Uh, let's say just say high school graduate. And here we go. Uh, some of the stuff they have here. Uh, mostly the university ones, but they do have one for Dollars of the American Revolution, uh, which is offers three named scholarships for nursing students. Okay. Um, Let's see. If we take a look at this, that should give us some in ideas on what they require. Uh, and hopefully here it will require an uh, essay. Okay. Okay. Application instructions. Let's see. All right, uh, upload. Da, 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 da. All right. Okay, so here is uh, two actual essays that they want you to write. Okay. Uh, so they call them statements. Okay. So for uh, Daughter of American Revolution nursing scholarships, they want you to first off present a statement of a thousand words or less setting forth your career objectives. If applicable, your essay should relate to the specific area of study described in the scholarship. Okay. This is probably going to be your best opportunity to do analysis. So you would, so you'd probably want to try to, in, in this case, you'd want to analyze the, uh, analyze the particular specialty you want to go into. Okay. Uh, and then statement of a thousand of a hundred words or less describing why you're a worthy candidate to receive a DAR scholarship. Okay, that one's not so much aimed toward uh, uh, analysis, but that first one is. So just in general, uh, if you do a, a Google search for scholarship programs, again that'll get you all these aggregators, and then you can find an aggregator that has a good uh, quantity of them. That uh, collegescholarships.org site is probably going to be probably going to be one of the best ones. Okay. All right. So uh, we got kind of sidetracked there. So um, let's try, uh, let's try to do some more questions here. I see. I see one statement in the chat here uh, that uh, you're terrified of this essay because you suck at writing. Uh, that's that's an understandable fear. Okay, I can tell you that uh, it's really understandable because you're 
let's face it, this is uh, 1301 is entry level college writing. You're probably not used to having to write stuff with this much vigor. Okay. Uh, uh, I should say not vigor, but rigor is the word I wanted. Okay. See, I, I misspeak too. All right. So uh, you might not be used to something that has this rigor to it. Okay. Where you need to adhere to the these kinds of requirements, and on top of that, I'm ask I'm actually asking you to come up with your own topics. Uh, now, what I will say is that that's kind of an indictment on the way a lot of schooling goes. I know that there's a lot of English programs out there, uh, a lot of uh, public and private school English programs, where when you're given a writing assignment. You're not allowed to choose your own topic. You actually have to work with whatever topic the teacher gives you or whatever topic the textbook gives you. And that can be extremely limiting. And that can also lead to some people being afraid to write because now you're being judged based on is your answer correct based on what the textbook says or if it's, is it correct based on what the teacher wants. Okay. Uh, and this is going to be slightly different here because I'm not expecting a specific answer. I am not judging you based on what you write. I am judging you on how you write it. Okay. Now, worrying that your format is going to be all wrong is understandable. But as long as you uh, try to adhere to what the textbook, what this textbook is telling you in terms of structure, uh, and if you can take some coaching from both your peers and from what I'm telling you in the lectures, you should be okay. All right. Uh, I will say that Yagelsky's process where he's having you write uh, freehand drafts before you even outline is probably the best way to handle this sort of thing, okay? Uh, see, because Yagelsky doesn't want you to adhere to a framework right away. Uh, he wants you to try to be a bit more creative with it and uh, let things flow first, okay? Before you get into, uh, I have to do... A, B, C, D, E, F, the so on and so forth, okay? Uh, in this way, your structure is going to be a little bit more organic because it's going to come ha from how you naturally originally talked about the topic as opposed to trying to adhere to an arbitrary uh, framework, okay? Uh, now, okay, someone says I just suck at writing general. That's another reason why we do practice, okay? Uh, that's what, that's why I have you guys doing those discussion boards. Okay. Uh, these are for practice. And I will say I've had some, I've had a lot of success with people who thought they were really crummy writers. Uh, and they, as long as they had enough time to practice and, uh, were allowed to express themselves a bit, they actually turned out to be really good writers. Okay. Matter of fact, I can tell you one of those is actually my wife. Uh, because, uh, here's a fun story for you. She did her master's degree as distance learning, just like we're doing. Okay. Uh, she did, she did her, uh, master's entirely distance, uh, through, it was a program through University of Michigan and her program required her to take courses that were offered from, uh, at, by my recall, it was at least seven other colleges. Okay. And these were not just limited to colleges in the U.S. Uh, one of the colleges she had to take a course from was actually from Sweden. Uh, but the credits uh, transferred to her American degree. Now, the other thing was is that she was not used to doing a lot of writing because she's an engineer. And, and engineering tends to be a more technical form of uh, major in that you're mostly dealing with uh, mathematics, statistics, uh, measure, measurements and scientific measures and that sort of thing, okay? That was what she mainly dealt with all through undergrad. So now she had to get into her graduate study, and now all of a sudden they're asking her And she's kind of lost. She only did uh, limited amounts of essays when she was doing undergrad because she had a couple of uh, interesting uh, undergrad uh undergrad uh, electives that she took. Uh, I do recall one of them, one of them was a basic uh, music appreciation course and one of them was a course about Japanese culture, which she thought was interesting. Uh, but she had trouble with writing, okay? She really wasn't sure how to 
get the writing out there. And I wound up having to help her a lot with her with her grad. I actually wound up being her workshop group uh, by myself. So uh, I wound up reading these extensive essays that she had to do based on whatever research project she was doing or whatever uh, the class had assigned her. Okay. Uh, this was especially true for her uh, final project, which is, uh, for her, it was called a capstone project. Uh, she had to do uh, basically what amounted to a simulated uh, study for producing cars, okay? Uh, and she had to come up with a simulation that was going to match up with uh, what real-world uh, auto industry uh, engineers do. Uh, but then she also had to write about her findings, okay? So because of because of the fact that she'd had a lot of practice doing those essays before, and I'd helped her a lot, and I helped her with this one too, eventually she was able to be comfortable enough to uh, write a suitable essay that was going to be turned in uh, for her master's. Uh, and the entire degree was based on it, depended on it, and she passed. And she got her master's. She actually... Uh, walked walked the stage for her masters the week before I walked the stage for my masters. So, uh, so we got our, we both got our masters degrees in the same year. <laughs> That's basically what I'm saying. Uh, so if you're uneasy about writing, that's fine. Okay, it's okay to be uncomfortable about that. What I'd also say though is, it doesn't help you to try to force yourself to write. Okay, this is going to be a gradual thing. In order to get you comfortable with writing, you need to have some practice. That's why we put the discussion boards out there. That's why we have the uh, exercises uh, in your journals. That's why we have the exercises that are posted to the questions of the professor. Okay, these are all intended as practice. Okay, citation MLA format. I can understand that that can be very uh, overwhelming, okay, especially because MLA is very strict about how you do that, okay. Uh, that's part of the reason why this first one uh, is one where I don't really require it unless you uh, are using more than two sources, okay. However, uh, yes, a lot of schools do not teach it right. A lot of schools basically try to hammer instead of allowing you to see it in practice. Okay, uh, so uh, that's this is why, and I will be the first to admit that I have trouble with that too. Still, okay. Sometimes I have to refer back if I'm writing something scholarly, and I have to write refer back to how do I how do I cite this again? What do I do again? The, I will be easy. I will be the first to admit that there were certain uh, there were certain listings in my work cited for my master's thesis that I later found out that I did wrong, okay? But I still passed, okay? Uh, the main thing I would recommend is uh, if you guys have uh, the option on your web browser, which I would imagine most of you do, uh, set as a bookmark the Purdue OWL site just so that you can jump over to it. I see people talking about EasyBib. Uh, I would avoid that, mainly because EasyBib has this tendency to uh, create interesting and weird formatting for their uh, works cited pages that does not really jive with what MLA wants you to do. In fact, half the time, I think the stuff that EasyBib puts out there is Chicago style, which is not intended for essay writers. Okay. Chicago style is actually intended for for uh, book publishers, not uh, for student essay writers. Okay, <clears throat> so uh, yeah, I see we're kind of on a downer side here, so we'll try to perk this up a little bit at the end here. Uh, basically, all I can say is just don't get too discouraged about uh, writing. You guys are going to be able to handle this. Okay, uh, you have you're going to have plenty of tools at your disposal. Uh, you'll have Purdue Owl. You'll have each other. Uh, I'm I am certainly still usable as a resource. Okay, uh, and for sure, uh, if you have any issues that come up in regards to any of the essays that we do in this class, or even when we get into other projects like the blog. 
okay? If you have any concerns that come up in regards to writing those, by all means, address them here, address them to me directly, uh, post them to questions professor, okay? That's what, that's what I was initially there for before I started uh, posting uh, lecture exercises there, okay? So, uh, we've got about five minutes left in the session. We'll go ahead and uh, get folks to uh, a, have any more, uh, if anybody has any more questions. Today's hoodie, uh, not Frozen themed. Um, yeah, here's this this sleeve I want to show you. Uh, in person school, as far as I know, for uh, for the Dallas College Group, uh, at least at least it's my understanding that they are not going to try to do in person at least until the spring. Okay, so this entire fall semester is going to be online. Okay. Uh, as far as the hoodie goes, uh, it's not frozen, but you were close. Uh, this was a hoodie that I bought at Walt Disney World in uh, 20. We, we took a spring trip, uh, spring break trip there, uh, and I did. I was a fool and packed only shorts and t-shirts, and they had a near record cold snap in Orlando that left me freezing freezing my little behind off so uh, about halfway through the uh, about halfway through the trip I had to uh, buy this hoodie because I just couldn't take it anymore uh, yeah I, I lagged there it's uh, I it was 2015 I think it was uh, so if you're wondering what the pattern is on the sh on the shirt itself uh, it's actually uh, if you're from you probably know it's uh, sorcerer Mickey but it's his outline and uh, in the background of it is the uh, uh, Cinderella's castle and a bunch of spark sparkly uh, sparkles. All right. All right, got another minute here. Uh, if anybody has any uh, more uh, questions. All right, so we'll go ahead and wrap this up for today. Um, uh, next, the next video, next one of these, uh, as usual, it's going to be next Wednesday at 1 p.m. Uh, next week's lect next week's video lecture is going to be a. Uh, it's not. It's not going to be the analysis essay stuff I went over today. It's actually going to be a uh, look at a case study that Yagelsky did with a student uh, in regards to the ten uh, applying the ten core concepts. Uh, so uh, that's why I wanted to do that announce one now so that you guys could uh, have that information. Uh, then we'll go into more depth. We'll go into more detail in that when we get to the actual lecture in two weeks. Okay? All right. So uh, with that in mind, I'm going to cut off the recording here, and uh, we'll sign it out, and I will see everybody next week. Next week. Bye. Take it easy. Take it easy.